Foundation, syncing up with SUNY UWide programs. Good morning. My name is Nancy Montando. I'm the director of the SUNY Conference on Instruction and Technology. Last week, we kicked off CIT week with visits from our CIT sponsors, D2L, Class Technologies, and Ring Central. Our main conference kicks off tomorrow, uh, but today, syncing up with SUNY UI programs is the event that we're going to be bringing you. Before we get started, I wanted to share with you how we came to um, offer today's presentations. CIT 2021 is our first virtual CIT conference. And for those of you who have been to CIT in person, you know, we typically run seven to eight concurrent sessions that would include topics that are being presented today. Making the change to virtual, the planning committee decided it was important to limit the th to three concurrent sessions and keep the focus on campus collaborations and connections that are the heart of the CIT conference. At the same time, we recognize it is important to stay informed on SUNY pro SUNY wide programs and initiatives, and that is what the intention of this program today is all about. I want to thank you for your support of today's event and of CIT. Our first session today is an innovation update from Carrie Hatch, Associate Provost for Academic Services. Carrie? Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can see my screen. And we'll be going to presentation mode. There you go. So you guys got it? Yeah, looks good. Morning, everybody. Um, welcome to sort of CIT, I guess. Um, so this is labeled as an innovation update, but it really is what I, the, the approach I took to this is, is also uh, one of kind of a history lesson to remind us all of where we've been and why we do what we do, um, how FACT2 plays into that, how um, CIT plays into that, and how the Innovative Instruction Technology Grants play into that. And thinking about how we can do uh, some of this better. So what I do hope to do is kind of go through you know, a few slides, um, talk about where we've been, uh, what, what we're, where we currently are, and then, you know, have a conversation about how we can actually kind of go forward and maybe be more uh, effective. So interesting, um, 2011, so it's been 10 years since we made a major change um, in, in some funding mechanisms with the system office. So in 2011, um, there was a university-wide uh, funding uh, component called the Student Computing Access Program. We called it SCAP for short. Um, essentially, it was started back in the 80s or something like that when technology was first starting and we were building computer labs and um, campuses that needed some additional funding to, to kind of get started with technology. Over the course of the years, the uh, the thought was that it had just the, the money had just kind of gotten sucked up into the general budget of the campus and the original purpose of it, which was sort of to drive innovation, had been lost. Um, so we started a new program called the Innovative Instruction Technology Grant Program out of that. Um, and we put in a, a process in place centered around FACT, uh, the Faculty Advisory Council on Teaching and Technology. Um, and we really leveraged FACT as a way to drive the innovation and to really work more closely with the system office provost um, to, uh, to, to think about what it is that we, we do in the innovation front and how we could do better. Um, and then how do we actually take the information that we gather in our innovation efforts and present it to a broader community and share. So you can see here, this is the, essentially the flow that we started and still pretty much keep to um, with the innovative instruction technology grants. Um, so we're having our fact our, our CIT meeting um, this month in May. Um, generally in June, we have a retreat with the fact two uh, reps and the, um, the council with the provost. Um, and we, we kick around ideas about what we think fact two should look at how we should think about it, um, you know, what, what we might want to see out of the technology grants. Um, we kind of tighten that up in the fall um, and release basically uh, release the call um, sometime in the um, in the in the fall this period. Um, we've been doing this since um, 2012, the IITG. 
And you can see a list of the uh, funding that has gone out since that point in time. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of activities have been funded. Um, increasingly, we get um, you know we're, we're getting um, large you know pretty consistent numbers of proposals coming in. Um, so we over the course of two, from 2012 to 2019, we funded about 5.5 million dollars uh, worth of innovation technology grants. Um, unfortunately, you know, the pandemic hit in 2020 um, and didn't really have, you know, we didn't have the money, um, didn't do the funding. Um, here we are uh, looking at the uh, budget year 2021-22 uh, coming up, and we're still not sure how it's going to play out. Um, we're hopeful uh, that we will continue to receive the funding for IITG. We've got our groups ready and standing by. Um, we're also talking about, do we want to make some changes based on what we've learned from the pandemic? Um, you know, so it's still um, kind of a moving target on this. You know, some of the examples of the projects that we funded today um, that have, have scaled well. Um, the Open SUNY textbooks and OER services, um, you know, that was funded with IITG. Uh, we then put some system money to it as well. We carved some money out of the uh, library, um, this university-wide library budget. Um, and uh, then the state gave us $4 million extra year. Uh, you know, so that was something that started with IITG um, and has been able to expand and had have significant impact um, across the university, saved our students millions of dollars. Um, and um, we're actually doing some research now that shows that we're also doing uh, and we're, we're, we're getting improved results um, from our OER efforts with student success. Uh, we funded quite a few MOOCs. We funded MOOCs on the Coursera platform. We funded MOOCs on other platforms. Um, and I think what we've learned from that activity has also come into play in our activities with SUNY online degrees at scale. You know, so the hope is that some of the things that we do um, can drive to to such a you know to to a scale that we can actually sh establish shared shared services and uh, other mechanisms to support the innovations um, where where the innovations actually become just part of what we do and become part of the uh, the, the ecosystem that we sustain. Um, we've done some gaming initiatives in Minecraft. Um, we had some small. We did a, a, a really interesting project. Um, with the University of Buffalo and Oneonta to get um, get undergraduate research undergraduate students access to um, essentially um, big data computing um, from the University of Buffalo. Um, we've done applicate we've sponsored application development, esports, AR, VR um, experimentations. Um, so a lot of good stuff has been going on, uh, all of it driven by the campuses, all of it reported back out at CIT in one way or another. Um, we also, through this point, through this, in, these initiatives have been working with FACT2 um, with a variety, st establishing a variety of task groups. Um, so these are a list of the task groups we've established since 2011. Um, some really interesting things that, that have taken place there. And these also feed into our innovation cycle. Um, so oftentimes we'll see these task groups come out of innovative instruction technology grants or these task groups forming other innovation technology grant proposals. So it can come in either way. Um, uh, occasionally, almost on an annual basis, we hold fact two symposiums based out of that task group work. Uh, so you can see here a list of the um, uh, symposium that we have created uh, or sponsored since that point in time. Um, and, you know, if you haven't attended one of these, I would really encourage you to do, do so when we get a chance to come back. Um, and I can see that Carlos is on the line. Um, there he is waving. Because um, my favorite my favorite memory of the uh, one of the, the, uh, the symposia was uh, we in the virtual immersed in the uh, the virtual immersive pedagogy piece. Um, there was, uh, you could put on a pair of um, VR glasses and it would look like you were walking out on a two by four off the Sears Tower. And most of us were petrified and frightened 
and Carlos was performing dance moves on that 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 piece of wood. So uh, it's always a good thing to, to see people having a good time. Just out of curiosity, anybody else have any fond memories of the symposium that we've attended or that you've attended? I'm looking down the list. I might pick on a couple of people because everybody's being very quiet. Hey, Carrie, this is John Zelenak. Thank you, John. Hey, at that same one, uh, there was also um, a VR experience where you could uh, manipulate molecules. And so you were in a, an environment where you could put things together and take things apart. And so it was, you know, a STEM kind of thing. That was also as interesting as the as the uh, two by four, I thought. Yeah, and there was also a gentleman, I think, from Stanford, or, uh, a person who was just finishing up his, his dissertation um, and was projecting from his uh, VR uh, glasses what he was seeing, and it was a simulation of someone going into anaphylactic shock, and they were sitting on the table at the front of the room. That was pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, that was part of one of the presentations. Yes, that was excellent. Yeah. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do was kind of talk to you about, you know, what, what it is, what can we do to continue and enhance our innovation efforts? Uh, we are kicking around some ideas at the system office, obviously. What we do and say at the system office doesn't mean much unless, you know, it works for campuses um, and people on the campuses. Um, you know, so we, we will be looking at ways to refine um, the alignment of IITG. Um, the money that we have um, is good. Um, we'd like to see more of it, obviously. Um, we, over the, the last several years, we, we also had performance improvement funds. We were trying to align with the IITGs with the performance improvement fund. So you can kind of use the IITG as, uh, you know, kind of a, a starter grant to get some bigger money. Again, we don't really know where the performance improvement funds are going to be um, in the coming coming years as well. So, you know, we need to consider that. Um, we will be looking at other additional external funding opportunities and trying to align with maybe where some of the, the, uh, the larger um, grant opportunities are. Um, that's something we've tried to do in the past, and I think we can certainly get better at. Um, <clears throat> you know, we don't, again, we don't know whether or not we're going to have funding, so we do have to consider what we can do to, to continue to innovate, even if we don't have fund, funding. Um, one of the things that I, I, I really enjoy doing is to watch the venture capital money that flows into the ed tech space. There is more money going into ed tech now than ever before. Um, a lot of really interesting startups, a lot of innovation taking place in that, uh, that space. Um, we are talking about um, sponsoring activities like we did with the Adaptive Learning Days, which was, um, again, one of these, uh, the events that we had out of FACT2. Um, and that was um, a series of events um, that took place over the course of, I think, four weeks, um, looking at various adaptive learning platforms. It was only, I think, two hours a day for those four weeks. Um, and I think one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is that we can do a lot of this kind of activity very, um, very successfully virtually. Um, so before when we thought we would, we, we would do things, we always felt like we had to get together. And now we're looking at ways, well, are there things we can do that might be lighter, less expensive for participants? Maybe we do blending, we bring people together physically, and we also have remote components as well. But we're thinking about looking at act, looking at new startups that are out in the market that are doing interesting things with teaching and learning technologies and bringing them in to virtual events, maybe making them pay a, 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 a you know a, a small fee um, is kind of an entrance component to pay for the costs associated with CPD coordinating these activities. Um, so that's one of the things we're considering. Um, we're looking at establishing the possibility of pricing offers with new companies like this. So we, I, don't, I don't have to think I have to tell anybody here that you know contracting in the state university is difficult. We do have a process that we call pricing offers that companies can provide us discounts, um, you know, without having a formal contract in place. Campuses then have to take that discount and use their own local procurement processes to 
um, to procure the, the items, um, but it does provide us a way to get reasonable pricing out to campuses in a way that, that seems to make sense. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, one of the things we're also talking about is, uh, you know, looking at ways to create frameworks for sustainable innovation hubs and processes. So many institutions, um, you know, ASU, Southern New Hampshire, University of Texas, San Antonio, have formal innovation organizations. Um, and we are looking at ways to um, possibly do that within the system, um, possibly just kind of take our existing shared services and create innovation components within them. Um, and I think we've already got some of that started just in what we're doing with IITG, in fact, too. Um, you know, but really thinking about ways, are there ways that we can help campuses also do that? Um, because it is, uh, you know, we, we're seeing we're seeing other institutions uh, reap pretty significant results from that. You know, so this is just one example of a framework, um, you know, that I've looked at in the past, talking about, you know, how do you actually drive innovation in a sustainable way? Um, you know, normally you would you would look at your infrastructure and your services and you would carve out a particular component, particular portion, maybe 20% of, of your activities would go to the innovation efforts. Um, and then you can look at, you know, do you go for the moonshots, the transformational stuff, or do you stay within your core areas? Do you do combinations of those? Um, you know, so those are the kind of things that we're looking at, uh, looking at going forward in the future. So, I flew through those and I wanted to do that quickly because I did want to have conversations if we could about what it is that's worked for you, um, you know, what it is you'd like to see. Um, are there things we could be doing better um, in the IITG area or in the innovation front? Because right now is it's going to be a an opportunity for us to really re kind of reframe what it is um, that we're doing if we think we need to, and maybe we don't. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions, conversation if possible. And if not, I guess I can probably give you back a good chunk of your time, your time today. So I don't know if we want to do chat or if people just want to unmute. And I can pick on people. Okay, Chris, since no one's saying anything, uh, I'm going to pick on you. Because you're you're the IITG guy. Um, Apparently. <laughs> what, what do you think? No, this is good. I mean, that last slide. I like that last slide, Carrie. Uh, I do think uh, frequently about this idea of the moonshots versus kind of doing what we already do better. Um, and I think it depends on uh, you know where your campus is at, and and so you know some campuses it's like. Let's, you know, we we just need to do what we're doing better. And, and, and thinking of that as innovation, I think, is also an important thing, right? Because I think a lot of times campuses, they look at the, the large university centers and say, yeah, we can't just do what they're doing. We, you know, we have to kind of focus on our students' needs first. And right now, that's like all we could do. But, um, you know, that sometimes is innovation. And so I think we've kind of come around to that over the last few years. I've seen that. Um, so, so, yeah, so. I don't know. I mean, I hope we get IITG going again. You know, we had a good meeting about it a month ago with the Innovative Instruction Research Council about ideas about what to do when we pick that up again. So I'd really be curious to hear from others here about what they'd like to see in a new and improved IITG program. How's that for kicking the can? That's that's perfect. <laughs> oh God, who else can I pick on? Um, uh, can I speak? You may. Allison. Hi, uh, I'm Allison. I'm a librarian at City Campus. I know one of the things that we're kind of excited about the library, again, a bunch of nerds that we are, is the open access uh, uh, textbooks. And I was wondering, is like, is anyone put any thought to, it's like not just having obviously the uh, professors and obviously write their own open access textbooks because we it would really help out our students, but also having the students as like final capstone projects help out with writing some of our some of our textbooks. I do know that that um, oh gosh, who is the woman at the University of Buffalo that 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 did that? 
Um, and actually, we gave her a fact two in, uh, instruction award. Um, so there, are, there. Are, I'm not sure if that one was was um, IATG funded or not, but we did see really interesting results from that, and the students absolutely loved it. I'm looking to see if Mike Daly or Mark are on the line. I think Mike said it was Jessica Kruger. Yes, it was Jessica Kruger. And she was able to scale that very well too. And she has presented at CIT in the past. So yes, that is certainly possible. Carlos, you've been in playing in this game for a while. What do you what are you thinking? And you're muted, my friend. There we go. Mute. Um yeah, I've been thinking about that going, uh, and what's always interesting to me, I think everybody said some really wonderful things and some great things have come out of it, but um, I'm always thinking about where, how do we lead to the next, um, you know, sort of thing? What is that? Um, what could that be? <clears throat> and so that's what's always turning in my brain, um, particularly around um, things that we don't necessarily see readily there. You know, um, and, and in certain areas that may not seem to be uh, closely tied to um, technology. Um, so I'm trying to have those conversations. And perhaps um, I, I, the past few years I've been thinking that we could have some way to sort of ignite creativity, you know, ignite creativity. Um, there's, that we can move, move boundaries beyond where it might be. But. Isn't there an organization on your campus that, that focuses on creativity? Yeah, <clears throat> we have a, and so that's, you know, I think would be the next sort of, how can we, but what does that mean? And a lot of times we think of about it and, and as a person, you know, the, the resources are people and creativity in our mind and working and collaborating together, but how do we move that? And, and I think, I'm actually, I, I don't quote me on this, but I have a feeling that after this pandemic, that's going to push people in new ways because people have been, people who weren't equipped or, or felt like they couldn't do what they did virtually were able to do so and learned a lot. So I think that that now is going to turn the corner. We're going to get people in other areas that are, that are much more practice-based and in a studio or something really to look at that. Well, that would be my push anyway, so. <laughs> look at who else I can pick on. Kim, well, you've been involved in all of this space too. Yep. Um, I think there, um, I wanna pick up on a couple of things you said, Carrie, about how we tie all the various activities together. Um, between the work of groups like the FACT Council and the task groups and um, what we do in the UI programs. I think there, um, that has been uh, you know, successful for us. And I think as we think about what those future things are, what the next things look like, um, I think leveraging those cycles and those groups and those processes and tying them all together. Um, I'm going to do my update um, next. And part of what I want to come back to is what are some of those next things that we're seeing in terms of instructional models. So um, I think uh, building on the great work that we've done, not just in terms of specific initiatives, but in building this kind of processes and trying to support Kind of a culture of innovation. I think, you know, that's really um, the more we can do to to bring all that together. I guess that's what that's where my thoughts are this morning. Oh, student competitions. Um, sounds good, Mary Chapel. Um, how about Keith Lando? Keith, you've been you've been kind of on the, you know, you've, you've participated in most of these kinds of events and uh, yeah. you submitted grants. I'd really like to hear from, from you as well. So I, I guess what I wanted to add to this is that um, I think we need to focus on, on culture. I mean, it's one thing to talk about process. It's one thing to talk about access to technology, vendor um, contracts and so forth. But I mean, going back to that open pedagogy example where 
you know, working with students to co-create the open educational resources. I've, I've played in that space a little bit with my own courses and have actually found that my students aren't very well prepared to play there. I mean, if we think about, uh, you know, the open, the OER model of you can adopt existing, you can adapt the existing, you can create your own. Uh, you know, I, what I was trying to do is get my students to take uh, an OER textbook on geology that was uh, developed out in Western Canada and do something very simple like, well, let's read, let's adapt this for our regional geology. And, you know, getting students to think about, oh, you mean I, I, I'm allowed to take the content from elsewhere and redo it? and so forth. I mean, we've, we've so, so beaten into our students' heads, don't plagiarize, don't plagiarize, don't plagiarize. And then we tell our students, oh, uh, let's take this textbook and repurpose it. So, uh, you know, it's, there are some tensions that we have to work out to, I think, make progress in some of these areas. Yeah, it's like, I know we at the library, it's like one of the biggest challenges is that we get so caught up with just very basics of citation and stuff I frankly find quite boring. It's like that we don't get into the higher order thinking of open access, fair use. It's like the, uh, the ethics of free flow of information, which is all increasingly important in high tech spaces. It's like our students in order to work in these spaces in the future, as well as on projects like OER, need to be able to understand when and how to use information, not just how to properly cite things and how not to plagiarize. Okay, I'm looking for more people to pick on. Somebody can always just step up. It's Michelle. There's a bunch of, um, there's some things in the chat you might want to. Okay. Uh, student funding, uh, funding student projects. I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was yep. kind of what I was just talking about. Uh, oh, Alex, you want to say some things? No, I was just listening um, with a lot of interest and to the conversation and and in and what we're brainstorming. And so, you know, I think about creativity and innovation a great deal, um, and um, you know, trying to understand um, exactly what it is. The Innovate Conference, for example, the OLC Innovate Conference um, is an entire conference devoted to innovation. I know Buffalo also has a creativity conference and, and all of these things are trying to um, get at how do we support it? How do we um, encourage it? How do we leverage it? And I think as I process thinking about it, um, I think that you know, the focus on, you know, either catalyzing or incentivizing or whatever, either creativity or innovation is the wrong place to put the focus. I think the focus is what is the problem that we have? And, and then that becomes the catalyst for innovative and creative thinking. You have to start with something that's really perplexing or something that's really vexing. Um, and, and as a result of that, comes, it's sort of like, um, uh, you know, the catalyst, I guess is the word, um, uh, for thinking or looking at some problem or some solution in a different way um, than you typically do. Because if you keep thinking about it in the same way, you just get the same results, right? Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's just some of the things I've been thinking. Um, Jill, you've been on the fact to group uh, council for, for quite a bit, um, doing different things, uh, being in the uh, task groups, anything you want to add or anything you're thinking about in terms of driving innovation? I mean, and you, you know, you're coming at it from kind of that non-traditional space as well. 
Yeah, yeah. And and I was thinking, I, I wrote down a big long paragraph here in the chat and have been hesitating on hitting hitting send hit, because hit, send, send, send. <laughs> um well really what I'm thinking about is is I'm not so sure it fits, right? Because fact two and, and a lot of the IITG grants talk, I'm I'm looking online at the the various themes. Um and what I'm thinking most about right now uh, out of the pandemic is um this group is much, much about teaching and technology and instruction, instructional model driven. Um, I've been thinking about the people, the staff and the faculty and about the legacy of that forced online experience. Um, there's both, so there's two things from a staff perspective, how can we operationalize working remotely in some sense across New York state? We know that this is a, this is driven at the, at a much higher level. Um, and you know, the ability to telecommute has been something that's huge. And I think, so, so that's one thing, and that may not be app appropriate for this group. And then the other thing is um, about a course scheduling. As students became more um, apt to, I think there was often demand for them to take online courses or remote courses at our campuses. Now they've all had a taste of it. And we know we're already seeing trends that these um, even in-person uh, students want to have some mix of online and um, in-person classes and the campuses may not be ready to or, or able to project what that is. And I know we're, we're having such a huge demand for online courses. To me, idea of um, investing time and figure out, figuring out a, a, a way to project section and seat needs that integrates both on campus and fully online students is would be a, a worthy uh, effort but n neither of those I don't think are all that innovative <laughs> it's much more practical <laughs> so that that's why I didn't hit send Carrie <laughs> uh, one of the things I you know to let you folks make you folks aware of too is I've been involved in a process um, with a couple other people um, at the request of the uh, COO and the provost um, to, to look at the recruitment to completion pipeline services that exist out of the system office um, to kind of put up, put up, to see where we can make improvements. You know, so we've, we've looked at our recruitment efforts from the system office. We've looked at the application services area where people can apply to SUNY and how people apply to SUNY. Um, we've engaged in conversations with a variety of entities within the system office that support student success. Um, and uh, we'll be presenting our, um, and we're also looking at our own internal organizational structures and arrangements um, to see if there's things we can do to improve. What's really been interesting in that process is we had a great meeting last week um, <clears throat> with a group of people from across the, the system office um, about student success. And student success is one of those areas where it touches the university life office, it touches the provost office, it touches the community college office, and there are huge opportunities for some, some significant gains in that space <clears throat> as we look. And what was really interesting from that, that conversation, to me, that was one of the most, that was a really free, free flowing conversation across people that have significant investment in student success and really thinking about ways that we can make that better, how we can pull our various programs, whether it's OER, whether it's guided pathways, whether it's the jobs to the future for the future kind of work coming out of the community college, but looking at all of those things and making them more, um, more impactful. Um, and I do think that that student success area is certainly, um, something we have to count, we have to really take a look at and look at hard and really get good at. Because I don't know if you've been seeing, the, I mean, obviously you, you folks have been seeing the numbers, um, you know, and enrollments are getting tough to come by. Um, and if, if we get students, we darn well better keep them and we darn well better get them out and graduated. So, I, you know, I do think there's some really interesting things that are gonna come out of that. My sense is that work um, which will also be presented to the chancellor will probably drive where some of the, the system office strategic initiatives go. Um, and obviously, as I've said before, I do think that, you know, we're going to try to look to align the IITG work and the IITG activities um, with, with uh, the system efforts. 
Um, and I think we are about at time. My, my computer clock is always off by a few minutes unless I log into the VPN. But I think we were supposed to go to about, what, 940? And we're at about time, correct? Yes, it's 938. OK. Um, and if anybody else wants a copy of that uh, report from Entangled that I mentioned in the chat, uh, or again, shoot me an email, and I'll get it out to folks. And uh, we'll, I'll shoot a copy of the slides over to, uh, to Nancy, and uh, they will appear magically in the CPD environment. All right, thanks, everybody. Have a great day.